Glenn Ray. Okay, uh, Glenn Raymond Jr. High. Yes. Okay. All right. It, well, I can start you there. It, and go ahead. It, it's grades five through eight. Okay. It's a public school. Um, okay. I teach primarily eighth grade, and it is earth science for every student. Um, we made a conscious decision uh, 16 years ago to move earth science from sixth grade to eighth grade because our high school does not offer any earth science. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, they're exposed to it. Um, okay. My first earth science class was uh, freshman year in college. So um, I didn't really get a chance to experience earth science formally uh, until I got to college. Um, my nice. background uh, growing up, my parents always took us to national parks. Um, we always visited a cave. Um, I don't know if you can see in my background, uh, I've got some cave memorabilia. Um, I'm an avid cave explorer and surveyor. I spend a lot of time in Southern Indiana. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it got me interested in uh, geology from an informal standpoint. Um, my original plan was to be an engineer, aerospace engineering, uh, went to U of I and uh, took a geology course and uh, was just loved it. It was an elective, but I loved it and I changed my career path at that stage. Um, I spent a year at the Illinois State Geological Survey working with the education extension, uh, went against my father's wishes and got a master's degree in teaching and ended up teaching. Um, I, and I love it. I, I get the best of both worlds. I get to share a passion for geology and earth science and uh, get, get to do it in a classroom. So, um, nice. so that, that's a brief summation of where I'm at, so. So in this transition now then to, to online and, and remote instruction, what are some things that you're doing to continue um, your earth science classes? It's challenging. Um, I'm trying to do videos. Uh, so, for example, as I shared, uh, my students have already seen the uh, the, sh the shatter cone striation, but uh, um, trying to do uh, there's a, a trend on Twitter using stones at home, and so I'll share each week a different rock or specimen that I have. Uh, Fossil Fridays. Um, yeah, I have a very extensive fossil collection, so I'll share some of those things. Um, we are doing Zoom meetings. Uh, in fact, we all have one tomorrow. Uh, this isn't in geology, it's more meteorology. That's the section we're in right now. Uh, students have been doing uh, two weeks of weather observations, including cloud types, uh, cloud coverage, humidity, barometers. I showed them how to make their own little barometer that can tell whether the pressure is going high or lower using a balloon in a baby food jar. So I had a video on how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so they were doing that. And uh, tomorrow we're gonna take a look at the data and say, okay, is there any patterns? Is there any correlations? Can we forecast what the weather is gonna be like in 24 hours based on our observa observations of the previous days? So i um, trying to get them to stay engaged as much as possible. Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of informal. But uh, yes. I've been very fortunate that they 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 enjoy it. Yeah. Now, uh, two uh, things: that uh, one on your on your logging weather. Have you seen the Globe program stuff? I am familiar with the Globe program. Um, I, I I I like doing some of that stuff, but I also like trying to get them to be the investigators. Um, I've done this one for a number of years and mm -hmm. created my own. Basically, this is what we're going to work with, and uh, you know, having them go out, collect the data, create the graphs, create the charts, and then using their data from what they've observed in order to to come up with their claims, and then back it by the evidence of their data. Now that that is what the globe does. They it's it's the students collecting data, and so if you haven't seen it in a few years, because it's gone through a lot of changes. And they even have an app that students can go out and record it and mm -hmm. submit it, which is one thing that I really like. But uh, so yeah. check that out later and see how you like that. A lot of teachers we work with are actually using that. Okay. 
part of their weather units. And then okay. students not only make inferences for what they have at their school, they can see other input that students have made from around the world. And I'll so, definitely take a look at that. And so and my next thing is, you said you're doing video. Are you making the videos and put, put in, how are you doing the videos and getting those to the students? That's a good question. So, cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And uh, I, my, my daughter's in seventh grade. And so uh, I actually have her in class. So she is my cinematographer. So okay. I'll have her videotape. And uh, then I'll upload it onto my computer. I use Movie Maker, kind of do a little bit of editing, uh, and then uh, I'll upload it to Google Class. Um, we're set up for Google Class, which I really enjoy. Um, there's some things that I'd like to see differently, but for doing this type of remote learning, it, it's been very helpful. So I'll upload the video there, post it as material. They can view the video from there. Um, they can either type in stuff as with questions or uh, concept ideas uh, or when we have a zoom meeting then we can bring that up as well perfect nice. um, we also yeah. i we have an active twitter account and uh, so i'll shorten the video and i'll put it on twitter as well uh, right now we are uh, because we're in remote learning uh, we have what's called the virtual mr simpson so <laughs> i have oh, no. guy. It looks just like me, and uh, <laughs> we tweet him out two or three times a week, uh, just uh, just to kind of keep things light and uh, let people know, hey, you know what, uh, we're still trying to learn, we're trying to get through this, uh, and uh, have a little fun with it as well. Had you used Movie Maker before all of this? Had you had a lot of experience? How easy, if someone's never made videos before, how easy, um, it's Windows Movie Maker, is that right? Yes. Yeah, um, I find it very easy. I've used Apple as well. Um, we all have Microsoft products at school. Um, of course, then we've got Apple products at home, but uh, Movie Maker, it's very simple. You, you take uh, the video, you upload it, into Movie Maker, uh, it takes a couple minutes for it to render, and then you can. They've got a, a toolbar with everything that you need. If you need to rotate the video, if you can, you can clip it. Um, if you want to, you can add uh, voiceover. So, for example, we had a student at the high school. Um, I'm I'm the public address announcer for our football and basketball teams, and uh, he was doing a highlight video. So he sent me a couple of videos. And then I did the voiceover for it to match it up. So you can even do voiceover on the video as well. Oh, that's great. awesome. Now, so you're uploading those straight to your Google Classroom. So all of your students have access to that, right? Absolutely. Yep. Any issues with cross platform? Because I know you said you have Apple, some lot of times you have Apple at home, and it, it, any issues with that? No, because uh, with Movie Maker, you can render the video once you've worked it and you got tweaked the way you want it. You can save it. It saves as an MP4 file. And then so it, it just uploads as a standalone movie. So they can click on it. It opens up and then they can they can view it. Oh, nice. perfect. What are you having them do? Uh, once you put like a movie up, what are you having them do with it? Well, one of the things is as they watch it, um, I usually give them two or three questions. Uh, I don't like to give them more than that because then it becomes overload, becomes work. But just one or two, three questions about the video. Um, two of them are directly information stuff from the video. And then the third one typically is an inquiry. So how can we use this information, for example, to go ahead and go to the next step? So um, an example, one of the things I'm working on now is uh, trying to do my turkey run trip, which I take eighth graders on, not all of them get to go. So to create a virtual trip and being able to cover the same material, but from a virtual standpoint. Uh, so we might say, okay, we, we have this rock, it's not sandstone. It doesn't, it's not the same rock as the canyons. Where did it come from? what kind of information do we know that gives us clues to give us an idea of where this rock came from and then how does it get there so they have to start making claims looking at the evidence so 
Uh, one or two questions on a video would be more, I guess, lack of a better term, general information. And then the third question is more of, okay, how can I take it uh, and apply it to what we're doing? So uh, that's. I like the. Go ahead, yeah, sorry. I like the limit on the questions too. Um, I think that's that's important because, it, like you said, that with the overload, that's just a lot with all, and that's just one of the classes. And I think that's that's a really good way to. I like that idea. Well, and that's one of the challenging challenges with remote learning right now. Um, and I have the advantage. I have my daughter here. So I can kind of gauge how much work is too much and what's is yeah. over. So one of the things that I'm doing right now with remote learning is I have them come in. They every student checks in every day, and it's just a matter of going on Google Class. Wow. I have an attendance form. I don't care when they check in, uh, but I have an attendance form just to see okay who's checking in, what time, and I have one question on that attendance form. Uh, I call it the big what. I, I call it the big I, I, question, and it's question. just something about the topic that we're covering for that day. Um, a lot of times, there's no answer. It's just, okay, this is what I think, or this is what uh, I, I understand, or what I don't know. And then we use that as a jumping off point for whatever we're discussing. That's great. Now, you said with that, it's, you said to use a form. Is that a Google form then it's that you're putting form. on? Yep, it's a Google form. Oh, there we go. Uh, my, my, computer just went down for a second. Uh, it's a Google form and it's really easy. I use the same form. I make a copy. I change the dates. I repost it. So Perfect. I have the template already there and I may change, yeah. I'll change the date. I'll change the question and it takes two minutes and, and they get, get that. And then and you they, said you're, you're, you're getting all your students every day checking in just, just 80 percent. 80 percent of my wow. students. Yeah. Um, which is nice. Um, I yeah. feel kind of lucky actually. Um, now we have students that don't have the technology, so we have to do hard copies and we, we do that every Wednesday uh, and have it at school. But uh, um, I start with that attendance and then I'll have one activity that to do for a day. It might be a, a guided reading one day, or it might be a real short little vocab type thing. Uh, I know everyone cringes when you say vocab. But uh, it, it's a real short, okay, here are a few key concepts or key ideas or key terms. Do we know what those are? And give them a very short, like a five or 10 point quiz. That's it. Um, trying to keep it simple and leaving more of the discussions. That's where I find out, okay, are they understanding things? I love that. I love that you're doing multiple modes of hitting them. With the different things, and yet you're keeping a, a very much in balance the, their balance in mind. I know early on some of uh, some teachers like, oh, this is probably what I would sign if they were there in class. So you know, an hour of class, hour of homework every day. And then all of a sudden, it's like, holy cow, you want kids to do what? But uh, so I think you're doing a great job keeping that balance in by and asking. I like the fact that you're asking questions just just to make sure that they've got the content. And then you're asking questions for higher level thinking. All right, so what would you do with this? I like that you're incorporating those in the videos. Cool. Yeah, it's. Not, I, it, I like that you're reflecting too with your having your daughter at home. That you're taking that into consideration and seeing what she's doing. This sounds like a lot of good self reflection, and I think that's really important too. So. Well, and that's one of the keys. Uh, I'm kind of a. I, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I want. I want it to be the best, a and. Even when we take trips, when we do normal class situation, I always look back and go, okay, that didn't go quite the way I wanted it to. How can I change it? How can I make it better? Um, what's a better angle at it? Um, you know, one of the things, and, and I've mentioned, I, we go to Turkey Run every year with eighth graders. Um, I'm very fortunate that I can take trips with our kids. We have a science club. Uh, for some reason, the last 15 years, our science club trips have been very geo-focused. Um, but uh, at Turkey Run, it started out just being a canoe trip. And we take uh, along the Sugar Creek and we'd look at the rocks and we'd look, you know, crinoid fragments in the river. And uh, the canoe places started to kind of shut down, especially in September and when we go on our trip. 
So we focused in on the geology of Turkey Run. I did my junior college junior research at Turkey Run, so I'm kind of familiar with the area. And we started off with just looking at the rocks. I'll talk, I'll ask some questions, and that's about it. Um, the last 10 years, we've went to more of almost kind of like a, a, a true field trip where we've actually taken field notes. And so one of the things that we, we did the last couple of years is um, I have these clipboards and uh, one side is got our little scale and different types oh, yeah. of sedimentary or sediments and sizes. And we got our arrow thing here. And then on the other side, uh, we've got our little field guide that I created that they can go through. And it's got a couple key questions. Once again, limiting the number of questions and then allowing them to fill in. What are they seeing? What are they observing? Um, it, you know, I was talking to my wife about this podcast and, you know, she asked me, well, why did you get into geology to begin with? And I thought of three things. Uh, one, I remember walking into the geology lab and seeing all these specimens. I mean, just hundreds of specimens. I'm like, whoa, this is cool. Then the second thing was the engaging instructors. Um, I, very, I was fortunate to have some of the best geology instructors, instructors around. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois. Um, Dr. Marthak is one of the premier structural geologists and he was my instructor, um, you know, and I, I start looking at that. And then the third thing was the field trips. What made the field trips exciting? Well, they were hands on. And so incorporating a lot of that into my current classroom, you know, what were the things that hooked me? I want to use those in my class. So um, one of the hooks is on our field guide. And, I go to forestry suppliers and I get waterproof paper. And oh. so I use our laser copier, print it off. And I don't know if you can see, um, I, I can send you guys a copy of this if you want. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, so um, it's just a simple one sheet, half, half thing and waterproof paper. And the first thing the kids do when we go down into uh, to the canyon by the uh, the small stream, they take their paper, right? dumping it in the water. That's the very first yeah. thing to do. Are you sure? Right. Waterproof? Yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah, do it. Yeah, that's the hook. <laughs> I've got them the rest of the day. Yeah, as soon as they get that, and so we immediately go and start taking a look at Turkey Run, and uh, we we look at it from two different perspectives: the glaciation and how glaciers impact that area and then the paleozoic how did that rock get there in the first place so we look at it from both perspectives um and uh it, it's amazing it, for two hours it's it's it just took line and sinker and uh, they're asking questions uh we have 25 to 30 students that go along myself along with our sixth grade science teacher um we're convincing her geoscience is cool uh, but she's our physical general science teacher. Uh, and we have four or five parent chaperones. And, uh, you know, they just, we go together. Uh, they spread out amongst us in a certain area. I throw out questions here and there. Um, one of the things that uh, we started doing is uh, we'll take a piece of paper and uh, we'll bring crayons and we'll do rubbings of our uh, cross-bedded flintstone. And so that way they, they've got that and they can look at, they can measure the angles. If we go to that level, not every class can do that, but we'll, we'll take a look at the crossbed sandstone. They've got evidence. Um, it, it, it's kind of cool. I wish we could spend more time there. But uh, uh, as you guys may know, you could spend days there and not see everything. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we, love, we would, we'd, we'd go to Turkey run every year. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and and I shouldn't tell you this because this is a little trade secret and I don't really want it to get out. Um, we don't do trail three. Trail three is the popular trail. Everyone loves trail three. You got wedge rock. You've got the, you got the punch bowl. You got the ladders. Every school goes there. We actually do trail six, which is behind the lodge. And there you're all by yourself. Nobody goes there and you can see everything. Everything that Trail 3 has, for the most part, is on Trail 6. And in fact, I think there's some more stuff there. And so we, we basically had the 
it's a outdoor classroom to ourselves. So uh, we like trail six. So my study guide goes with trail six. Mm -hmm. um, we, also, we, we can do trail two as well. That's another one of my favorites. Um, but uh, so that's, uh, that's my secret. <laughs> 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 well, just uh, the three of us and, well, the internet, no. So. <laughs> right. Uh, the world. <laughs> so, we're, so we're safe. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it's, uh, it, you know, that's, that's a disadvantage with Turkey Run. Uh, every, Trail 3 is very popular. Everyone likes to go there. There's some great stuff there. Um, I know they've really done some things uh, with, with the trail. They've built up the uh, pathway and keeping you away from the rocks, which is which is a good thing because of the environmental impact. But right. uh, with Trail 6, nobody being there is perfect. <clears throat> um, that actually came about because they were working on Trail 3 at one time and it was closed. So we had to change to Trail 6. So we had to kind of switch on the fly and it worked out really well. Uh, oh, cool. My kids still remember Trail Six. I think the last time we were on that, uh, it would, we were hiking it and it started hailing on us. Uh, <laughs> my dad yeah, is part of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking time for these. Uh, yeah. Really impressed. I like the I like the fact that you're at the you're doing a daily check on with the yeah. Google form and. If, that you've actually thought about that and where you're just copying it so you can crank those out quite easily and then be able to see um in those uh google form syncs with a um, google sheet right yeah be able to see easily who um actually filled that out yeah mm -hmm. and so I, I like that you've thought about it. that's the first time i've heard someone talk about oh well i'm still doing attendance but i'm doing it this way because i know uh, sometimes teachers would do a um we call it exit ticket or something like that in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're still doing one, and that's awesome. I haven't heard the other teachers talk about that yet, so that's something uh, yeah. that I have I like <laughs> a lot. Well, and one thing with the with the form as well. One of the questions was, when we do a Zoom, when is the best time for you? And so that was one of it. And I, you know, I can see okay, 31 percent will be able to bank it at nine o'clock. 23% will make it at 10, 25% uh, at one o'clock. Uh, so I can actually plan my Zoom meetings uh, accordingly. And right. honestly, it doesn't matter which class they're in during the normal school day. Um, all I do is check into one of those. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so it gives them a lot of flexibility. And also with the attendance is, it's interesting to see what time kids check in. It's yeah. A bell curve, you know, from like nine o'clock to one o'clock, it's a nice. That's where the majority is, sixty-three percent, sixty-six percent or so. And then you got your outliers, three a.m. Um, right. Night. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it's a, that's funny. a great way of uh, interpreting graphs as well. Right. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that I would be cool. We'll throw that back at them here soon. Here's our <laughs> what people are doing. No, well, I that in my back pocket. I'm ready to go with that one. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time. We appreciate this. Yes, thank you, Troy. No problem. And, hey, thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. An outstanding on review. iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Tweet us your science questions. At Purdue SOS. Until next time, be super. And remember. You are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.